No, looking down there would be a tactical error, Nikki. <laughs> okay, I'll be looking at the camera as much as possible, Rob. <laughs> and I'll be projecting more as well as I can, and I'll edit all this shit out. Which right there is not projecting. Okay. <laughs> so, hubs. <laughs> yes, wife. <laughs> oh, just before we get started, this inf is, in fact, not a fake backdrop, just as an backdrop. aside. It's yeah. real wood. It's real wood. Um, okay the topic at hand, we are going to be talking about cholesterol today, specifically as it relates to the ketogenic diet, because we've had some questions that have popped up, uh, one in particular from the recent video that we did on the difference between paleo and keto. And I'm just going to read a section of that for you guys. Um, Randy says he's been eating keto for the last eight months. Prior to that was paleo for three plus years. Uh, he harvests and processes a lot of his own meat, so everything's perfectly organic, but he's noticed that since January, his cholesterol has gone up quite a bit since eating keto. And so he's wondering, uh, is he screwing up somewhere? Is this okay that my numbers are higher than normal? They're still considered low, low risk in the Western medicine world, but he is curious if he's doing something wrong. Man, there, you know, the cholesterol topic is huge. And so as part of the keto masterclass, we put together a, a pretty extensive uh, download on that and we, we cover it uh, pretty thoroughly. And uh, the, the takeaway that I'm gonna throw out here right at the beginning, like if uh, you don't wanna hang in for the whole thing, is it depends. Like there's a lot of nuance in this. One thing that does pop out immediately is uh, dairy products like butter, although they can be fantastic. In some people, they do absolutely increase cholesterol and most importantly, lipoprotein. So there are some people that for whatever reason, they are particularly sensitive to uh, dairy products. Uh, Dominic Diagostino noticed that in himself. And so although he maintains a ketogenic diet, he has really de-emphasized dairy as kind of a backbone and has gone with other fats. And I believe he took his uh, lipoprotein numbers from like 2200 down to like 1200 or something. Mm -hmm. uh, now within all that context though, you know, a lot of people go keto or low carb and their total cholesterol, their lipoproteins drop a lot because there's a couple of different routes to seeing those things increase. If we are over consuming food in general and uh, carbohydrates is kind of a backbone of that, then these excess carbohydrates get converted into palmitate. The palmitate gets converted into cholesterol in this kind of long drawn out process, HMG-CoA reductase enzyme that's involved with all this stuff. This is the enzyme that statins work on. But there are ways that we can see cholesterol and lipoproteins increase on a, a low carb, high fat diet. Uh, some of this again relates to uh, the dairy issue. Some of it may be a gut permeability response, even though we're addressing some elements of gut permeability. Um, a higher fat diet may actually bring some LPS, some lipopolysaccharide into circulation, and that can be an inflammatory effect. And so this is where some people, when they're tinkering with this stuff in the beginning, they would do much better to have a high protein, high fiber, comparatively low fat diet while they burn their own body fat, then their gut heals and they're not translocating that, that LPS from the gut into the circulation, which absolutely can drive up lipoproteins. But those are just a few of the, you know, the different pieces to this whole story. And it seems like there's so much nuance and also, and you know, you can expand upon this, but sometimes the standard testing that people are getting aren't give, isn't telling the whole story. No, it, it never is. So the standard blood test of total cholesterol, HDL, LDL cholesterol, triglycerides, blood glucose, is virtually a guarantee for more confusion than delineation of what's going on. Occasionally you have somebody that is super dyslipidemic and it's like, okay, we clearly have some problems. You could calculate a triglyceride to HDL ratio, for example, and have a sense of the relative insulin sensitivity of the individual. So there is some merit to it. But, you know, adding on an inexpensive uh, LDLP, LDL particle count should be absolutely a bare minimum. And anybody trying to figure out if they should do a statin or they should do, you know, any one of a number of interventions, if you're trying to make that decision without at least knowing the LDLP and possibly the LPIR score, which this is something that we use a lot at the specialty health clinic here in Reno, you're just flying blind. And that's aside from all the story behind do statins actually do anything beneficial. You know, there's all, all this other stuff to unpack. But before you even get to that, if you haven't done that level of testing, you are just flying blind. Because sometimes people can have 
uh, what appears to be high cholesterol from standard testing, and and we're gonna, you know, actually it's my my aunt in particular, um, and so all of her blood work points, or at least the standard blood work points to her being put on a statin, uh, but she actually has no damage to her. So yeah, th- this is an interesting backstory with Nikki's aunt. Uh, she's sixty. Three, mm-hmm. generally super healthy, has walked and exercised her whole life. She's eaten kind of paleo esque for paleo. for a number of years. Well, she she deviates a, a bit, bit a bit more than than a lot of folks, but in the grand scheme of things, not a big deal. But uh, she was going in uh, looking at uh, some routine blood work for an unrelated issue, and they discovered that she had a heart murmur that she had probably suffered from her Since whole her life, early 20s, and, yeah. and it was getting bad enough that she was getting some left ventricular hypertrophy, which is going to end up being really bad, and so they were uh, uh, scheduling her for a heart valve replacement. Again, this is non-dietary related. This is a congenital kind of birth defect. Lots of people have these heart murmurs. Not all of them turn into the need for a heart valve replacement. But as part of this heart valve replacement, they do the, the angiograph where they run the camera up her femoral artery, cruise through the heart, and her heart and, and uh, arteries were completely devoid no, no of plaque. any type of plaque. Yeah, completely clean. So that's a piece of the story. The other piece of the story is she does have kind of high cholesterol, but when we look at her lipoproteins, the lipoproteins are low, and this is something called discordance. And this, in this situation, it's a beneficial discordance in which we have low lipoproteins. Lipoproteins are the things that carry cholesterol around the body, HDL, LDL, VLDLs, what have you. You know, all these things need a protein-type package to carry these fatty, waxy substances around the body. So she's in a situation in which she has high cholesterol, she has low lipoproteins though. And then the real gold standard, in my mind, all these things are surrogates for disease process. They are not demonstration of disease process. When you go in and scope all the arteries and, and whatnot that would potentially be showing placking and you see none, there's no disease process. But despite this, her cardiologist is still like, wringing her hands and wanting to, to put this person on a, if you do on a trim statin. Off all the fat. <laughs> and, they, it, and, you know, this is ignoring all of the data that we now understand that uh, in women, um, statins have never really shown any efficacy of, of preventing car- cardiac events, of extending life. It increases the likelihood of type 2 diabetes by perhaps 50%, which is, is itself a cardiovascular disease risk. So that's a whole ironic twist of, of uh, circumstances. And there's great data suggesting that women, particularly as they get older, the higher the cholesterol levels, the less likely they are to die You know, in an all-cause mortality setting. We do know that folks who generally have higher cholesterol and higher li- lipoproteins are less likely to develop cancer. Now, this is all a trade-off. Like, do you want to die of cancer? Or do you want to die of cardiovascular disease? You're going to die of something from somewhere eventually, but you know, it's just a lot of fear and a lot of uh, maybe dodgy clinical interventions, you know, uh, uh, pharmaceutical interventions are being done with very little information. Right. So you unpack a lot of this stuff, talk about these discordant scenarios in this guide that we put together called Cholesterol and Keto, What You Need to Know. Again, it's part of the Keto Masterclass, but we've pulled that out and we're making it available to any of you who want it. Just click the link below, uh, give us your email address, and we'll send that straight to you. I'm cold. (laughs) There we go.